let's get started. Um, I hope you can hear me well. For some reason, the drawer is locked, and so I don't have a microphone to clip on. Can you hear me in the back? Okay, cool. So today uh, will be the last lecture talking about um, neural networks. I kind of promised talking about um, Elmo and Bert, but I decided not to do that and instead talk a little bit more about um, residual networks and other building blocks that you will need for the homework. I want to start with a brief recap on uh, convolutional neural nets. So in convolutional neural networks, instead of having a full matrix uh, that connects uh, input with the hidden layer or hidden layer with the next hidden layer, instead you have uh, filters, as shown here, that are usually uh, much smaller than the input, and uh, 1D for 1D signals, 2D for 2D signals like images, and you apply the same filter at each position in the input. Um, this allows you to be invariant to translations of the input, and also uh, you're sharing weights between each possible location, meaning you have much less parameters to learn than if you would use a full dense connection. We also looked at this uh, uh, convolutional neural network architectures. Um, so this is like a very old one that we briefly looked at, um, but it has the same characteristic as modern ones. You have uh, layers of convolutions. The output of each convolution is a layer with, which has several feature maps, which are, um, which basically mirror the topology of the input space. So here, the input is a 2D image, and the result of each convolution is, again, a 2D image. Uh, here in the first layer, we have six different filters leading to six different feature maps that are all shaped like the image. Then there's operations to reduce the dimensionality of the data or the resolution. In this case here, there was subsampling in uh, this uh, 89 paper. In modern papers, it's usually, or modern networks, it's usually max pooling. Also here, uh, in this uh, very old architecture, there was one convolution followed by one max pooling layer. And um, in mo uh, modern architectures, usually it's several convolutions followed by a max pooling layer. And then in the end, you have um, fully connected layers. So basically, uh, if you get very close to uh, the target, you, um, you basically drop this uh, topology that you had from the input, in this case, this 2D topology of the input image, and you just flatten it and you use um, uh, full weight matrices instead of convolutions. This leads to uh, most of the weights in such a network actually being in the fully connected layers in the very end because the features only, uh, sorry, the filters only have very few parameters to learn. I wanted to give a brief example of the difference between fully connected and convolutional networks. Um, and so I want to apply both to the original MNIST data set, which are handwritten digits, and the permuted version of MNIST. So here, the bottom is exactly the same as the top, only I got a permutation of the 784 pixels and I applied the same permutation over everything in the train data set. So I just um, changed the order of the features. And I want to see what does this to um, fully connected and convolutional networks. Um, maybe a uh, quick question. So if you would use a random forest, um, what would the effect of this be? Any example, any, any idea if you use a second load random forest on the top versus the bottom? Um, the answer was it would be, or that it was given was it would be do well on top and not well on the bottom. That's wrong. It is um, exactly identical. 
anything inside can learn, like random forests, don't use the order of the features. It only matters um, what the feature values are. It, uh, the model doesn't care about if something's feature zero or feature one. So to anything in scikit-learn, these two data sets are completely identical. Is specific random forest, like before when you say skin and it doesn't matter when you mean trees? Oh, this is not specific to random forest, any, any model in scikit-learn, because it assumes rectangular data. And so the order of the features doesn't matter. The features are treated as coheating completely independently. Uh, none of the models, like linear models or neural networks or anything, cares about um, whether feature one and two are related or whether feature one and um, 217 are related. So um, this transformation that just uh, shuffles the, uh, the pixels doesn't change anything on basically all the models we've seen so far. If you do PCA, if you do k-means, whatever, it'll do it as well on the top as on the bottom. Sorry, how, how can we use reshape minus one? Reshape minus one just means the remaining dimensions. So here, the remaining dimensions are 60,000 for the training data set and um, 10,000 for the test data set. Oh, Yes, yeah, so it's the same as shape zero, yeah. And basically, you, you can have one minus one in first the dimension. Okay, so I'm gonna use um, here a very small fully connected neural network um, with an input shape of 784 and a hidden layer of 512, so this is a single hidden layer. I'm using the Kara sequential interface uh, with the rectified linear unit in the hidden layer and the softmax unit in the output layer. And if I compile the model, um, this is sort of the result. Um, if I call summary, so there's um, 512 hidden units. There's parameters between the input and the hidden units are uh, about 400,000. And then between the hidden units and the output layer are about um, 5,000. And I'm gonna, so that's just a very small uh, standard neural network. And I'm gonna uh, compare this to um, also a small convolutional network where um, I'm again using the Kara sequential interface. I start with a 2D convolution with filters of size three times three. Um, I have 32 of these filters so it means I have 32 input maps. I do max pooling in two by two windows. I do another three by three convolution. I do another um, two by two max pooling. I flatten the output and I create a, a dense layer. And then I have the number of classes in the output layer with a soft max activation. Um, okay, question is how do I choose the pool size, the kernel size, and the number of features? Um, I just made them up. Um, well, basically the pool size two by two is pretty standard. Um, that's what generally um, is used in convolutional networks for images. Um, there's works that don't, that use different um, sizes, but that's sort of the most standard one. I think uh, three by three kernel size is also what most modern networks use, and the 32 is uh, basically pretty arbitrary, similar to the 512 in the network. How did I pick 512? I just picked 512. Um, it's about the order of magnitude of the input, the 512, the 32. Um, I don't think I actually have any heuristic why I picked 32, it's pretty arbitrary. No, 32 is not like, any power of two would be fine. I probably could have also <coughs> used eight and it would have also worked. And also, uh, also for the fully connected um, sequential model, um, is it okay if we add a flatten layer before dense, then we don't have to reshape the actual kernel? Sorry, I didn't get that. Can we just add a flatten layer uh, before the dense layer? 
in a sequence just to reconnect it that works, then we don't have to reshape X. Um, then X yes. will be 28 times 28, and then we in input that 28 times 28, and then we just add a flag to that. Yeah, I mean, you, you could, be, instead of reshaping the input before you give it to your network, you could put a flatten layer uh, in the so fully connected that's network. The that's the same, yeah. I mean, now, it makes the network more complicated a little bit, and so um, you would do the reshaping in each, uh, on each mini batch, in each iteration. I mean, it's uh, no op, so it's, it doesn't take any computation, but still sort of, I would just do it once before training but it, it would result in the same out. All right. So here are training curves on the original data um, for a conventional neural network on a training validation set. Um, you can see that they're both pretty good uh, at like 98% accuracy. Training set overfits a little bit, but um, both of these two do very well. I didn't really put a lot of effort into tuning these, so this is not state of the art, and this is run on my laptop, but it's like, it solves the task pretty well. Um, if I look at the dense neural network, it does like slightly worse, and you can see that it overfits much more strongly. So here, um, the dense neural network, the green line, um, rises much further above the validation set. Of course, uh, this has uh, much more parameters, as you can see here. So the dense neural network has like 400,000 parameters. The convolutional neural network has only 61,000 parameters. It might make think sense to think that the dense neural network would overfit more. But so the point of this illustration is now, what happens on the shuffle data? And um, as I already told you, on the dense data, uh, on dense neural network, nothing happens. The red and green curves are completely identical to the one on the left-hand side. And um, maybe it takes a little bit of thinking about why this is, but again, the order of the feature doesn't matter to the network at all. Whereas the convolutional neural network actually uses the structure of the image. So the convolutional neural network does much worse on the shuffle data. Actually, when I ran, ran this, I was kind of surprised that the shuffle data is still, uh, it does 90% accurate, but it's probably because the filter sizes are very small and the data set is just very simple. So even though I completely destroyed the data set for uh, the 2D structure, the convolutional net still kind of works. But you can see that the convolutional net is pretty heavily impacted by the dense neural network doesn't care at all. All right, this was sort of just trying to illustrate um, the difference in approach of uh, using convolutional networks and using dense neural networks. So the next thing I want to talk about is um, coming back to more advanced techniques for building neural networks. Last time we talked about dropout and about batch normalization. And um, the last one that I wanted to talk about that uh, is very important in recent networks is um, residual networks or residual layers. So people have observed that it's actually quite hard to train very deep networks. This is a graph from the ResNet paper and you, it shows on the left-hand side training error, on the right-hand side test error. error. And um, so what they're trying to show here is that if you look on the training set side, they have a 20-layer network and a 56-layer network. And these are like quite a bit deeper than what we look at so far. Um, what's somewhat surprising here is that the 56-layer network has a higher training set error. What that means is that the optimization was not able to fit this model. You would assume that because it has a lot more parameters, this will be able to overfit the data perfectly very quickly because it's so deep and has so many parameters. 
However, because uh, it is so deep and the function is very complex, or the function can, functions it can express are very complex, and uh, as we discussed, this is, um, the gradient descent here is like a local optimization procedure, so it's not, you're not guaranteed to find a global optimum. So what happens is it basically, uh, it gets stuck in a local optimum that is not as good. So um, if it could find a global optimum, it could always do better than the 20 layers. It could basically just make the uh, remaining um, 36 layers all just be the identity, and then it would be as good as the 20 layer network. Or it could learn even more and would be much better than a 20 la layer network. But so you can see that um, you, we have trouble fitting these very deep networks. Why do we care? Because um, we saw that the deeper uh, networks usually perform much better. And um, so we hope that if we could train deeper networks, we could improve state of the art. The solution that this paper proposed is in a sense um, quite elementary and quite simple, but also quite genius, um, which is instead of learning the function f of x, they learn the residual from the identity. So instead of uh, having weight layers with rectified linear uh, activations, and then say, I want to um, uh, learn this f of x. Instead, what we're learning is the difference of um, what these layers exp express, should express to the identity. So if you learned the function f of x be equal to 0, it would just be the, uh, the these two layers would together just express the identity. So we added this shortcut connection that says, um, we take the input to this uh, to this part of the network. We and uh, well, on the one hand, we push it through these layers and apply the weights and the nonlinearities. But we also take the identity, and then we combine the outcome of these layers with the identity. In a sense, this makes it much easier to learn the identity, and it allows uh, um, the gradients to propagate through the network more easily. So here, this works if the size of x is the size is the same size as the output of the second weight layer. So in principle, adding the skip connection allows the model to express the, exactly the same functions but it changes the optimization problem. And so, turns out, this optimization problem with this added skip connection is much easier to solve. You can also do um, something similar where the layers have different sizes, where instead of having an identity skip connection, you have a linear connection. So WS is the weights for the skip, skip connection. There's not a nonlinearity here. And this is basically, if you, um, you want to skip a pooling layer, you sort of need to reshape the image, basically. Um, one important part here is that the skip connection always skips two layer, not one layer. And um, the reason for this is that the addition is before the rectified linear unit. So if you skip a single layer, you wouldn't actually do anything. So you need to have some nonlinearity in the layer that you're skipping. Otherwise, um, otherwise it does, nothing happens. So usually you have, I mean, theoretically you could do different things, but usually you have blocks of two layers that you, to which you add a skip connection.
here is an architecture um, that I proposed in this network. VGG19 on the left hand side is um, was like a state of the art model when this paper came out. Uh, double check when, when did it come out? Uh, 2015. Um, so, and uh, so there was 19 layers. And um, so they proposed this 34 layer neural network. The colors correspond to blocks of convolutions. So here there's a pooling layer, convolution, convolution, pooling, convolution, 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 pooling, and so on. So uh, they change the color every time there's a pooling operation. So here they just created this very, very deep network for comparison. And then they created this um, architecture that has this skip connection, the residual neural network. And they created identity matrices skipping all pairs of two layers. The, um, the dotted lines here are when, they, when the skipping includes a pooling layer, so they need to do some reshaping. But other than that, the only thing that happens is you add an identity transformation that uh, skips two layers. And so the number of um, parameters, the number of weights you're learning in the center network and in the network on the right is exactly the same. But what they show is that the model on the right hand side actually performs much better. So here they're training this on ImageNet, so large scale image classification. On the left hand side we see um, the, the, the plane network which is uh, the thing that was in the center. And on the right hand side, we see the residual network. And um, as we saw in the graph before, in, um, okay, so the, the thin curves are training error and the bold curves are validation error here. And so we can see that on the plane network, the deeper network is worse, both on the training and the validation set. So again, we were unable to fit the deeper model. It's even worse on the training set. We were not able to overfit the training set. We are not able to tune all the layers in this model. For the rest net, on the right hand side, you can see that adding more layers actually improve performance. And it pr improved performance not only on the training set, but also on the validation set. So you can see both the uh, thin curve, which is the training set error, and the thick curve, which is the validation set error, they're both uh, much lower. And so this paper introduced basically a new state-of-the-art uh, network on ImageNet and showed that you can train this much, much deeper networks. Here, this is um, again from their paper. Actually, oh. So, VGG, as I said, it has like, this one has uh, 19 layers. The batch norm inception was whatever Google came up with at that time. That was also quite deep, but not as deep as the ResNet. And so here they created a ResNet with 34 layers, which was basically deeper than anything anyone had ever done. And then it, they said, oh, well, why don't we add a couple more layers? They did 50 layers, 101 layers, and 152 layers. And the 152 layers, which no one until then was able to train the network this deep, uh, became new state of the art. And so uh, and any state of the art model since then uses this technique uh, for image recognition. But this technique is generally applicable to learn very deep neural networks. So this was um, in December 2015. The current state of the art 
is 50% um, top one error. So we got four, we shaved off 4% in the last four years. Huh, I didn't realize that was that. But um, this technique has been like quite fundamental in uh, making a big change in what kind of architectures can be trained. Questions about the idea? So the question was, what gets passed out? So here, th this unit adds these two together and then applies the ReLU activation function. And everything that comes afterwards takes this as input. So this is also the input for the next skip connection. Oh, OK. So the next skip connection takes FX. Yeah, the next skip connection takes FX. So we're, we're trying to learn this function. Um, Say g of x equal to y, and g of x equal to y is f of x plus x. So it's basically the difference. For, we're trying to learn a function, but we're expressing it as a difference from identity. All right. So I want to briefly discuss how we can uh, implement this with Keras. This requires using the functional API that I misspelled. So in a sequential API that we saw so far, we always have one layer following the other layers, so it's very linear. And we, we couldn't add these skip connections. In the functional API, we actually Basically, we write down the, the graph of, of layers. So we again, we use the same, the same uh, layers, for example, the dense layer. And um, when we use a different model, instead of the sequential model, we use the model model. We specify the input as an input object. And uh, this is basically a TensorFlow tensor. Um, what that means is not really that important, but you should think of it as a node at a in the compute graph. So here, this input, we, we know about it. It's the number of features, 784. Then we take this input, feed it into the first uh, dense layer, and the output is a new tensor that we call x. Then this, the result of this layer, we feed into, let's say, another uh, dense layer, and uh, call the output again x. This is copied from the uh, Keras uh, documentation. I find it a little bit confusing that they call both of the tensors x, but whatever. And then the predictions are um, a dense layer with 10, activa 10 units activation softmax applied to the output of the last layer. So here, I apply, what I'm doing is I apply the layer to the input uh, or to the, the output of the layer before. And so in this way, I create, in this case here, a simple chain of operations going from the input to predictions. Then I create a model where the input is the input and the outputs are the prediction. So I basically, I created this graph of operations and I identified this is the thing I should, where I want to put my input, this is the thing where I'm looking for the output. And then I can do uh, the same thing I did with the sequential interface. I can call compile and uh, fit the model. So this is just a slightly different way to um, write down the network. So here, this would be a network with um, two hidden layers and 64 hidden units 
and uh, 10 class classification problem on an MNIST. So this we could express with a sequential model, but, um, sorry, with a sequential API, but uh, this API is more flexible. Um, before we add the, flat, the script connections, I wanna show another example here. This is um, con creating a convolutional neural network. Again, I start with the input, then I take my convolutional 2D layer with 32 um, filters, each time, uh, size three by three, and ReLU activations and apply it to the input. Because I want to add the skip connections here, I tell it to use padding equal to same, which means that I'm using same convolutions, which means the output of the convolution will be the same size as the input. So this is sort of one of the three ways to do convolutions that we talked about last time where we can do valid, same, and full. And um, depending on which one you, you choose, either the input shrinks, expands, or stays the same. Here, because we want to add skip connections, we make sure the size of the input stays the same. So here I have two convolutional layers, the max pooling layer, two convolutional layers, the max pooling layer. And so for the sequential interface, I would just have a list of all of these and call sequential on it. Here, I have the, this input tensor and apply the layer to the input tensor, gives me an output tensor for this layer, and I give this as input to the next one, and so on. So this is just a slightly different way of writing this down. The benefit is now that we can add additional things that are outside of the sequence. So, um, unfortunately I didn't have time to make this actually work, but I want to at least uh, show you the principle, which is here the skip two would uh, be a layer that takes as input the output of max pool one, so the max pooling after the first convolutional layers and confirm that two. So this would be a st skip connection skipping the second block. Okay, it takes these two and just adds them together. And then this, the next layer takes the output of the skip two. Here, um, If you look at this list, um, it looks kind of uh, kind of uh, linear, but actually if you look at here in the end, unfortunately it's cut off in the connected column, you can see that the add layer is connected both with the max pooling layer uh, here and the conf2d layer here. So we no longer have a simple chain of operations. We have this uh, add layer that takes um, the input from the max pooling layer, but also adds the output from the max pooling, sorry, the, takes the output of the convolutional layer, but also adds the output from the um, max pooling layer earlier. So I think this network is just too small, which is why uh, learning here didn't really work. Um, or it might be that I messed up the order of the ReLU and the skip connection. But yeah, but this is sort of how you in principle write down these more uh, complex architectures with skip connection using the, the functional interface. So the question was, if the size is um, different, what can we do? So if you, um, I mean, okay, you need to make the size the same. So you could upsample them, for example. I'm not sure if there's a 2D upsampling layer, but I'm, well, there probably is. Uh, or, or you need to 
sorry, you need to downsample the input. You need to do something with the input. For a densely connected network, you would usually just create a linear layer, so a dense layer without the nonlinearity. Um, for convolutional networks, you need to do some downsampling operation. So if you look at this architecture, they actually um, do it around the max pooling. So here you're allowed to skip the max pooling. I mean, I, I basically, I, I added a connection from max pool one to conf 2.2. Two. So this means I'm allowed to skip these two guys, conf 2.1 uh, and conf 2.2. Because I take the output of the guy before that and add it to the output of this. That means you're allowed to skip conf 2.1 and conf 2.2. Well, I mean, th it means that there's an identity that goes from uh, I mean, yeah, it means there's an identity transformation that keeps the results. So, so I'm it's at up to the computer to whether to skip or not? I mean, no, you, you're always going both ways. You go identity transformation via the skip connection, and you go with the uh, nonlinearities through the layers, and then you add the results. So after this, um, people got even a little bit more crazy and created what's called DenseNet, or densely connected convolutional networks, which take this idea um, basically even further. So here, they, um, so these are layers of convolutions. And um, oh, sorry. So uh, these these are sorry. These are feature maps. There's a layer of convolution, feature maps, layer of convolution, and so on. And so they they added skip connections basically from each layer to each other layer. So you're allowed to skip each layer individually, and you're but you're also allowed to skip forward. Okay. You, you're allowed to skip forward one step, two steps, and so on, uh, as often as you want. And so here, at the top, this is basically one densely connected block of convolutions. So here, they all work on the same size image. And so we have convolutions, and convolutions, 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 and every time you can skip each of the layers, and you can go from any layer to any other layer. Then there's um, there's a pooling, and then you have another block. So. From here to here is one layer of convolutions. So for each of the maps here, there's a filter for the maps here. So this is sort of one layer of doing convolutions. But um, we're also allowing the um, output of this to not go through um, these convolutions, but to just directly go into the next layer. So this layer here, H2, can take inputs from H1, but can also take inputs from the original input. This guy here, H3, can take input from H2, from H1, or from the input. So that each uh, layer has access to the output of all previous layers. 
And so now we're moving even further from this sort of very linear thing to like a very like uh, complex graph. I mean, that's just um, a convolution without any skip connections. Like the same um, networks again, but without any skip connections in them. Like, you have dense block one, which, con uh, which contains all the layers, and then you have dense block two. So between them again, I think there's just, I think it's just one convolution, but I would need to double check. And so um, this, again, made like a big difference in, uh, in performance. And so it used much less parameters and got much better um, results. Um, so this was basically another neat trick. This is not used as much. It's not as much of. Um, like a fundamental building block now, but it was definitely something that advanced state of the art then. So, um, I mean, the idea here is again that it's easier to propagate gradients through this because the gradients from the very back via the skip connection can uh, be a, can help learn the weights in the uh, very front. So basically, you you creating shorter path from the output to the input. And the shorter path allows the gradients to, um, to be propagated more efficiently. So th these big networks are actually um, built into Keras in a pre-trained way. So here's a couple of those. I think this is not the very newest one, but um, if you go to keras.io slash applications, you can see all of these different networks that were um, set of the art on ImageNet at some point. And you can see um, how big they are, the number of parameters, the depth, um, and uh, you can load them and play with them and basically use them as a starting point for building new architectures. And so here, one, I mean, so these dense nets are quite commonly used because they're pretty good uh, while still not being too big. Mobile net um, is, uh, they try to compress or create a, a smaller network that can run on mobile devices. So this was basically optimized for um, being good while also being very small. Where very small these days means 88 layers, which is not that small. So these are all trained on the image. Let me go to the next slide. <laughs> so these are all trained on, uh, so these are architectures, but they're also trained on ImageNet, so you have the weights of ImageNet here. The reason why this is good is that you can actually use these for your own applications. That is one form of what's called transfer learning. In the simplest form of transfer learning, you just take some network, here I have VDG 18, I think, or uh, VDG 16, which is like small and bad by current standards. But, um, so you use the same mm, network, and instead of um, running it through the whole network, you go to the um, second to last layer. So this is basically the input to the last, uh, last layer that makes a decision. So in our case, we're not usually interested in the thousand classes that are an ImageNet, but we want to do our own thing. And so 
people found that basically because ImageNet is so big and um, the classes are so diverse, the representations that are learned on ImageNet transfer very well to other tasks that have natural images. And so we can use this network and not re relearn it um, and use it basically as feature extraction. And I want to give an example of um, one silly application that I did, which is trying to learn uh, ball snakes versus carpet pythons. Ball snakes are also pythons, so two different kinds of pythons that, we, that I want to distinguish. Um, one of the benefits of using these pre-trained networks is that I can get away with a much, much smaller uh, data set. So training these very deep architectures takes hundreds of thousands or millions of images and lots of GPU time. Usually, we don't have hundreds of thousands of annotated images for whatever tasks we're interested in. What I did was um, actually I just downloaded uh, some images from Flickr um, via the Flickr API, just searching for carpet python and ball snake. These are the results, and I actually I just used 100 um, samples for each of the two classes. So I have 200 samples in my training data set. This is an absurdly tiny data set to learn a neural network. It would be completely impossible to learn a neural network from this. But because I don't want to learn a neural network, I just use the neural network that was already trained, um, I can get away with this. You can see the data set is a little bit noisy, so this is not a ball snake. This is also actually, I don't think this is a carpet python, but I'm not entirely sure. Oh, maybe it is. Okay, so how are we gonna use these uh, pre-trained networks? So here, again, if I do this, did this now, I probably would use not the VDG 16, but a different network. First, I need to reshape my images so that I could put them into the network. The network accepts particular order of channels and um, particular image size. And so um, from KRSRP processing, I use image, and image uh, has the right functionalities to put the data in the right shape. I load the VDG16 data um, neural network, so it's included in the KRS applications, and I say include the top layer equal to false, meaning the last layer that actually does the classification, I r remove that. Because I'm not interested in these like um, 1,000 classes, I'm interested in my two classes here. And I, I tell it to load the ImageNet weights. So this provides me with the architecture together with um, the weights trained on ImageNet. Oh, yeah, then I do, there's also specific uh, pre-processing for VDG16. So I pre-process my input, and then I call predict on the model, uh, with the model. And so the output, so X here was 200 images. They were all, after pre-processing, 224 times 224 and RGB. And um, the output of the uh, model, so the second to last layer is, again, I have 200 images. They're now, the resolution was downscaled to seven times seven, and there's uh, 512 uh, feature maps. So, I think I could also, I could just uh, average the, across the seven times seven, but what I'm doing here is I just uh, ravel everything so I get a very big feature vector that's uh, seven times seven times 512, uh, yeah. Oh, how, do you how did I do that? Probably scipy.readImage, or if you say uh, imageio.readImage. The, whenever there's any code on the slides, there's a notebook in the repository that has all the code. Okay, so, yeah, so now here, 
I I I've, I flatten everything out so that I have one long feature vector for each of my 200 images. And um, then actually I'm just applying logistic regression on this. Um, and I can see that on the training set I'm 100% accurate. Um, and on the test set I'm 82% accurate, which is actually not too bad given that I only have uh, 100 training images each and there's a significant amount of label noise. So I don't want to go into uh, like that much detail here, but this is a very, very powerful pattern uh, using um, a neural network with weights that are trained on some generic task and then applying the same network to your task. I removed doing this from the homework because I wanted to have you play a little bit more with the architectures. So instead, we're, you're, play, you're doing a ResNet now instead of doing um, this feature extraction. Yes, so that's like, it's this guy here. Okay, so then with the, 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 the attacker features, you then uh, feed it into like other dense semantic layers that you design yourself and then they ask to have dense layers in addition? I mean, yeah. Basically, I use logistic regression, which is the same as a single dense layer. Oh, okay. Like, logi multi-class logistic regression is one dense layer. But uh, I did that here because I wanted to use scikit-learn. I could have also just um, added a new dense layer and retrained it. Okay, I I, um, I skipped the train test split. Oh, okay. I, I then called train test split on features underscore. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. So here, x train and x test are the features underscore split into training and test data. So this was just um, taking the output of the convolutional layer. There's another option, which is fine tuning. In fine tuning, um, you replace the output layer, and then you uh, learn not only the output layer, which is basically what I did with logistic regression, but you learn also, uh, you change all the initial weights. So here in fine tuning, you would um, remove the last layer, add a new fresh last layer, then um, you would usually train just the last layer for a couple of iterations, and then you would do pr back propagation through the whole network. So you will fine tune the weights, uh, like the, all the convolutional filters, to better batch your task. You want to um, train the last layer for a little bit before you do that, because um, the last layer, if you create a new last layer, it's initialized randomly. If you just do back propagation, back propagation through the whole network, you would destroy the pre-trained weights. And so you just, basically you start by just training the last layer, and then once it's sort of good enough, you do back propagation to the whole net, and you adjust all the filters uh, to do well on your specific task. This, um, I mean, this requires more computation, because you need to like train a big network, and also pos potentially uh, requires more data because um, it's, more it's easier to overfit now. If I just use 100 images and try to adjust everything in this big network, I very easily can overfit. But this is sort of the um, slightly more complex way to do uh, transfer learning by um, starting with a pre-trained neural network and then adjusting it for your task.
and that's so using either just the output or of a network or doing the fine tuning is how anyone in industry would ap uh, approach any new computer vision problem. So it's very unlikely that uh, anyone would start from scratch from anything. Um, if you have natural images, then um, people would use a pre-trained image net net. Or there's also pre-trained networks that are trained on even larger data sets. In the homework, you actually have an image data set that's not natural images. You have um, like images of uh, like medical images of tissue. On uh, these, you could try to use a pre-trained network, but it's it doesn't really make that much sense because um, the images have very different statistic. So if you have something like medical images or something that is like a vi for a very particular domain, it might make sense to train things from scratch. For example, you might not even have an RGB image. You might have different channels because you have different sensors. Like if you have an infrared camera um, or a depth camera, you can't even use these things. Or if you have x-ray, um, the structure of the image is quite different, and then you would start from scratch. If you have a natural image, then it makes a lot of sense to start from uh, one of these pre-trained networks. All right, so the last topic in neural networks I want to talk about is um, going beyond what's called feedforward neural networks to recurrent neural networks, which basically are networks that deal with uh, time series or any kind of series object. In particular, they can deal with um, variable length series. The main idea of Recurrent neural networks is, in the simplest case, you have some input x, a hidden layer h, and uh, then some output uh, o. And at each time step, you observe some new input x. But you not only observe the x, you also get input from the hidden layer at the last time step. This is what this v this is basically a self-connection of H to itself at the last time step. And so unfolded over time, it would look like this. So you have um, the prediction you want to make at XT. You have some connection uh, to hidden layer HT and then to the output OT. And you also have some input from the the hidden layer at t minus 1. Here there's also some um, weight sharing going on. So the weights that connect the input to the hidden layer are the same at each time step. The ones that connect the hidden layer to the output layer are also the same at each time step. And so the ones that connect uh, the last time step to the current time step are also always the same. And so the most straightforward application for this would be if you have an, um, have a time series, and for each point in the time series you want to create some output, you could use this architecture. So let's say you try to predict the weather. You have some, um, well, maybe weather is not that good an example. Well, let's, uh, let's try to predict the stock market. Let's say you have some economic um, factors and um, you try to predict the pr uh, price of a particular stock. And you ha also have not only as input the current economic factors, but also whatever you derive from past economic factors. So you can um, take the previous state into account. 
So basically the idea is that the H from the last time step summarizes everything you need to know about all the previous states. And so people originally did this where um, each of these errors here was just uh, say a single time, uh, a single weight matrix, let's say V or U or W, together with some nonlinearity. This has similar problems as with very deep convolutional neural networks is that if you try to propagate the error through the, the error through these, um, from here to say here, like from, um, this becomes very difficult. Also, if you try to keep, even if you just try to keep information in the hidden layer, um, like if there's long-term interactions between what happened a while ago and what's happening next, um, it's very hard to keep this state in H because you have all these multiplications as V. And um, so what uh, Hochreiter and Schmidhuber came up with in 1997 is what's called the LSTM unit, which stands for long short-term memory. This guy was ignored for about 10 years and then uh, became really popular in like the late uh, 20 somethings. And so here, instead of just having um, a single hidden state HT, we have our hidden state HT plus a control state CT and the control state and the hidden state of the previous step are combined to give you a control state and hidden state at the current step. And um, the way this works is, is depicted here. I actually might not want to go into all the details, but you can see that there's actually, um, th there's lots of in, uh, weight matrices so these F, T, I, T, O, T are all weight matrices um, that um, say, how does the input change the control state? Um, how does the last hidden state change the control state? And how is the output state, so, or sorry, the, how is the current hidden state influenced by the past hidden state and by the input? And so, yeah, I don't want to talk through the details, but b basically the, the idea is that depending on the control state, you can uh, remember th the previous hidden state or you can blend the previous hidden state with the current input or with whatever you derive from the current input. In a sense, this is actually quite related to the residual networks um, in that the goal is to allow the network to pass through information through several time steps. There's not a direct skip connection here, but this, this control state basically allows you to, um, uh, to forward information through a time step. So this is quite complicated and has a lot of, internal, of these internal weights to produce the, the next control state, the next time step. Um, there's an alternative that a friend of mine came up with to simplify this, um, which are called the GRU units. These only have um, two internal um, weights and do something similar to the LSTM units that I think people didn't really, um, well, take to the, that much. But so there's a, basically these LSTMs and the GRUs are both um, different layer types people use now to build these recurrent neural networks. And then basically each layer is replaced by one LSTM unit that has many of these internal uh, connections or sorry, that has all these internal connections that 
um, relate the control state and the hidden state. And so now, um, here, basically, you have this A is the repeating LSTM module, and for each time step, you have this LSTM module instead of just having a hidden layer. And people found this works much better than just having um, like single matrices and standard um, weight matrix and nonlinearity. And um, a lot of people are using LSTMs just as black box, and you basically don't really need to worry too much about what goes on inside this box, and you can just use this as um, a layer for building recurrent neural networks. So this arrangement here works well if you have an output for every input. So your output series is aligned with your input series. An example of this would be, okay, you make a prediction at every time step, or an example for this is your input series is the words in a sentence, and for each word you want to say, what is the part of speech tag for this? But if, if you want to do something where the series are not aligned, say you want to translate a sentence from um, English to German, then you couldn't use this. Because if you translate um, a sentence, the, the, you don't translate word by word. And there doesn't need to be the same number of words in the output as in the inputs. So, it's n so you have two series. But the series are not aligned. And uh, for this case, there um, was this uh, very interesting paper called Sequence to Sequence Learning with Neural Networks, where they basically use LSTMs, but they don't um, try to predict at uh, each time step, basically for the first couple of our time steps, they just feed in the series. So let's say your input is A, B, C. You feed in A, B, C, and then you, a special token that says end of sequence. So just imagine that being like a special word in your language or a special character. And then once the network sees this uh, end of sequence, you start looking at the outputs. And so the first output of the network, uh, in this case, here's W. You take the output, you feed it into the network, and you get the next output, which is x. You take this and feed it into the network, get y, and so on. And you let the net, uh, network produce outputs until at some point the network produces the EOS token, and then your um, sequence is over. And so you can use this architecture to predict sequences of arbitrary length from other sequences. And uh, this was predicted, um, uh, this was used uh, quite nicely for doing some uh, machine translation. So here uh, in this example, you have, um, this is an input layer, then there's uh, two layers of LSTMs. So this is, each of these blocks is an uh, LSTM layer. And so you have LSTM layers connected through time. And you have um, basically a depth too. And then you have an output layer in the end. And so here you could would feed in uh, your input, which are say, I am a student. Each word is one input. It's represented here. Um, basically, this is a word vector that's learned. The network aggregates all the inputs until it sees like the special character. And then it starts uh, producing outputs as distribution over words. So here, um, the, uh, you would pick the most common, uh, sorry, the, the most likely output, in this case, moi. 
you feed this into the network as input, you get another output, um, which is the next word, and so on. And then um, at some point, you, it, the network produces the end of uh, sequence, and then you basically finish with your translation. And uh, the most surprising thing about this is this actually works. And um, you can just train it with gradient descent. So basically, they just wrote down this huge neural network, you feed it in sequences, and you uh, train it with trying to predict these sequences. And if you have enough data and you run it for long enough, um, you can actually train this neural network. And so what's interesting is that basically the whole input sentence was compressed into um, the activations in these hidden layers. And then upon seeing the end of sentence uh, marker, the network can reproduce a translation of the sentence as a sequence. And so this kind of architecture has been used um, quite a bit. Um, for translation, also for question answering. And so this is um, right now for, um, so for some text understanding tasks, this is not used anymore and people use the um, uh, BERT and uh, ELMO, but this is for translation, I think similar models to this are still used. And so here for question answering, for example, you would just feed it a question as um, the input and the answer as the output and then do gradient descent and it'll learn. And that's uh, quite, quite something. Okay, I'm, I'm already over time, but um, the last thing I wanted to mention, which is sort of kind of important and, um, and applies to all neural networks is adversarial samples. Um, the idea in adversarial samples is that you can change input samples in a way that really confuse the network, in a way that would not confuse a human. So here, these are images from ImageNet that are classified as school bus and as whatever uh, bird this is. And on the right hand side, all of these images are classified as ostrich. And in between, this is the change that was applied to the images. So this is like very small magnitude change going from this to this. And the network is like really, really certain that this is an ostrich and this is an ostrich and this is an ostrich. Um, and so that uh, was kind of surprising. Um, so this is why the paper that sort of discovered this is intri called Intriguing Properties of, Natural Net uh, of Neural Networks. And um, you can very easily find these um, adversarial samples if you have the network. If you don't have the network, it's uh, a little bit harder and research is ongoing. But uh, just earlier today, uh, Ian Goodfellow tweeted at me that apparently uh, people now find uh, very stable adversarial examples that work across different architectures. So um, it's possible to confuse these neural networks by just doing very slight modifications. Yes, so you could definitely use this for, to, to fool like Facebook's Unity filter, or uh, which is why this is sort of concerning. There's actually people um, like printing stickers that you can put somewhere to confuse classifiers, and I think some people are like printing T-shirts that make you be not classified as a human. Um, so as I said here. A lot of this work is for very specific networks, so you need to, oh, sorry, you need to have the network that the process is using. We, obviously, we don't have the network that 
uh, Facebook is using to detect nudity, but people are working on things that are more robust and it might work uh, more broadly. All right, I should stop. <laughs>